Welcome to our show, Meaning and Motivation, where we'll explore the many ways we make meaning together and why we do what we do, our motivation. I'm your host, Tim Thompson, and with us tonight is Denny Lutz, a professor in Edinburgh University's Speech and Hearing Department and an expert on the mind-language connection. Denny, thanks for being with us. You're welcome. All right. Well, expert, expert boy. That's right. You know, I was, I was thinking about that as you said it, and, and as a disclaimer, um, the guys who wrote the books and articles I've read for the last 30 years were, were experts. I'm probably a parrot that's learned to say the right thing to get a really good cracker. <laughs> but an awfully <laughs> smart parrot. You've gotten a lot of crackers, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. but I mean, really, you know, I don't. Yeah. Well, one of the guys that's written those books that we were talking about earlier was Gregory Bateson. Gregory Bateson. And Bateson said, my idea of a pig is not a pig. What, what's that say about mind language? Well, is your idea of a pig my idea of a pig? I don't think so. No. no. So, the, uh, you know, when he was saying that, and, I, and he was heavily influenced by Alfred Korzybski, obviously, um, and Korzybski's uh, voluminous 960-page book, uh, science and Sanity, and, and Korzybski's basic statement throughout there was that we, do, we don't act on the world directly, we, we act on our maps of the world. Mm -hmm. So the idea of pig as it exists uh, for, for each of us um, is not the pig in reality, it's our abstraction of pigness. Mm -hmm. You know, on, on, on so many levels. I was thinking about it this morning when I put my glasses on. Uh, and I think as I've gotten older, it's, it's become more maybe obvious to me that that thing that I experience as reality isn't reality. It's not the real thing or what's going on. It's, it's my abstraction. So, you know, wearing trifocals, you know, you take them off and Oh my God! The the All world. All of a sudden, you've got a different reality. Oh, the world right? just changed. I mean, it's just, and I put my glasses on, and oh my God! You know, it's 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 back again. So, I, I think that idea of every everything, what we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we smell, uh, what we intellectually experience, is just exactly that: abstractions. Well, if if it's abstractions, are we? Does that mean we're not? experiencing reality? I mean, as, as you sense the world around you, are, are we not experiencing reality? Or I what? think we're experiencing our reality and hopefully the salient features of that reality are close enough within most of us that we, we have a general consensus that this is mm -hmm. pretty much what it is. Uh, you know, the, I, I was thinking about the idea, and Bateson did a lot of work with schizophrenics. He's studying an awful lot of schizophrenics, and, and, and as you know, um, the idea of causation, you know, Bateson didn't go down that road of say, what, what causes uh, schizophrenia. You know, it's, a, it's an endless hole. You know, somebody's going to say, well, you know, it's... It's biological, it's inherent, you know, yada, yada, yada. And, and Bateson, Bateson really wasn't interested in, in going that way. He was more interested in what, are, what is reality like for these people? How, how, are they ex how are they experiencing that? What is it, you know, and so he, he kind of was a pagan ethnologist in that sense, just kind of watched their stories and, you know, tried to figure out uh, from that. And, and if reality or your conception of reality becomes, becomes decidedly different from those around you, then that group consensus of what is, you know, what is, or at least the, the, the salient features of what is, starts to give way, and then there's that sense of, um, incredible doubt of, of, of your own perceptions. Is this, oh my God, am I... Mm -hmm. am I mm -hmm. Or else it, not doubting your or, own perceptions, or, just not realizing why everyone else well, can't not see really, this reality. You know, and I, 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 so I guess that, that that idea of 
you know, how real is real. You know, Watslavic, that was his big, you know, how real is real. Um, I think they're salient features. And if you went, if you went clear back to, uh, like, the original phenomenologists, Heidegger and Husserl, and, you know, their big questions of, of um, uh, why are there essence and not nothing, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and that discovery of what, what essence are probably important for this thing to be have enough salient features to appear mm -hmm. real in a collective kind of way. And when you're speaking of real, well, stepping back just okay. to uh, Watzlawick, like to <coughs> Watzlawick yeah. and how real is real, one of his statements uh, in that book was, you know, my reality is better than your reality. Oh, yeah. And because your reality is wrong, you're either bad or mad. So what, what goes on with the <laughs> dynamics of... Well, isn't, you know, I mean, don't we, don't we kind of... Uh, isn't that the crest, crux of the biscuit in, in, in every kind of conflict there is? Is um, essentially a dispute with your construction of reality. You know, we, we don't go for the way you've constructed reality here, or in, in, in uh, Korzybski's words, we don't like your map. Right. Well, is that the, is that the problem, <laughs> you know. like when you get into politics and what's going on right now? Right now we have the Republican nominating process that's going on, and uh, they're giving their versions of reality and, of course, saying why President Obama is so wrong and so forth. But is that just a, is it a battle over reality, or definitions of reality? You know, I've thought about that of, of number one, I, I, you know, I don't, <laughs> number one, I don't know truly if, if, if they believe in actually what they're saying enough to, for it to be a construction of reality or just um, this seems like, back again to being a parrot that'll get a really good cracker, um, is, is, the, is, is this just going to get me the, the nice cracker that I'm interested in. Um, so I guess, you know, when, you, when we opened up with the idea of motivation, I guess that's probably part of it, is figuring out what, what, would, what would motivate someone um, to, to either construct a reality as such mm -hmm. um, or, or to have a different reality of it. Right. And, and some people would say power. You Maybe. Know, that, they're, that they're seeking power, but... Maybe. I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know. You know, uh, uh, DeVito... Boy, we're whipping the names out here. We're, <laughs> really? we're, we're, like, Name scho we're like scholarly <laughs> guys now. Um, I always like DeVito's um, model of communication. I, I, you know, and I'm sure you've seen it. Um, and I, I enjoyed when he talked about... And Bateson does this as well says that without context there is no meaning which is which is just a fabulous statement and you know and and and, and Bates you know the, the classic Bates in question where he asked his uh, um, the psychiatric residents that he was teaching even though he was not a psychiatrist nor a psychologist nor an MD um, if a mother rewards her son with ice cream for eating his spinach. Will the son come to love ice cream and hate spinach, love spinach and love ice cream, love or hate his mother? And I've kind of added one to that over the years or become an inventor who invents ice cream flavored spinach. What else would you really need to know to be able to answer that question? Don't you need all kinds of things? Yeah, and those things are all that thing that we would call context. Uh -huh. right. You know, all right. of it. So right. I, I think that if you if you take something uh, like DeVito saying that part of context would certainly be the the, the folkways mores of uh, the group that you were enculturated into which would be essentially the map that you were given, mm -hmm. if, if you think about it, you know, um, the sociological context. Sociological context meaning the era, the time, uh, exactly. the activity, you know, what's all going those on. things. And then 
probably lastly, according to DeVito, the psychological context. And that's where you would talk about wh what, is your, what is the motivation for this? Mm -hmm. why, why, why are they motivated to do this? What, you know, so I think that when I, when I think about politics, and it's, it's, to me it's, it's um, befuddling, uh, you know, I'm constantly going, you know, trying to ferret through what is that context that they're trying to, mm -hmm. to talk about here. And I guess that my map, when I, when I watch these things, um, is my past knowledge and experiences, my past histories, um, the mores and folkways uh, that were predominant when I was up and coming and, and so on and so forth. So, And you're, you're a child of the 60s. I'm a child of the 60s. So mm -hmm. um, I, that's my map. I'm, you know, and as intellectually as hard as I try to get out of it and say, you know, I realize that's a map and I realize I'm abstracting and I realize that um, that's probably the lens through which I abstract th this process. Um, it doesn't seem to help knowing it. <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's still the, it's still the same. I still come up with the same things. Mm -hmm. So you can't just say when you're looking for the motivation for politics, you know, and some people say it's just uh, into power. But who was it that uh, Kendall or uh, who? Uh, I'm trying to think of the author that was in the concentration camp, and he wrote the uh, logotherapy. Oh, oh, oh! Let me, give me one second. <coughs> I'll pull it out here, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, logo therapy. Well, but I, he said that, you know, well, yeah, you can bear any how if you have a why. It was his big Yeah, yeah, yeah. his big thing. He, he talked about logo or or, or meaning. Right. Um, meaning being the central motivation. The central or, or yeah, his big question was when he was studying that, you, you know, and I'm not going to pull the name out and it's going to frustrate the heck It'll out of me. It'll pop up in about 10 minutes. So. Yeah, I'm going through the ABCs in my head uh -huh. now trying to contextually pull it out. Uh -huh. um, oh, Victor Frankel. Victor Frankel, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah Victor Frankel was fascinated why some people seem to do relatively well in this in a prison camp they survived they you know uh, other people immediately died uh, and or or went into various states of of, of uh, um, disarray and he kind of came up with the idea of you can bear any how if you have a why and that why is is gives things meaning mm -hmm. and that idea of of logo or meaning i think we're all in search of that we're all trying to figure out what's what's this mean what what is the meaning of this how does this right whether it be the meaning of your current situation oh. or the meaning of life or seeking Anything. some kind of purpose or whatever. Purpose or the meaning of politics or the meaning of um, anything. And I, I, that idea, though, of, you know, and he, his therapy was really unique. I mean, he, he was another one of those guys like Bateson who, who was just this untethered kind of mm -hmm. um, rogue floating around. He would ask his patients... Uh, they would say something to him, oh, like I had to just kill myself, and he'd go, well, why don't you? <laughs> you know, which just flies in the face of, of, you know, you just don't say that. And if they said, well, my family would be crushed, he would say, well, there's your why. You know, there, there's, there's meaning for you. That's, that's logo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so that, that idea of finding meaning, uh, um, allowed him in that concentration camp, maybe allows all of us to, to kind of um, chart our boat through, uh, you know, all these waters of uncertainty and, and, and so on. Right. Like if you think of him uh, surviving the concentration camp oh God, and yeah. think of us as uh, surviving, in a sense, life and life, uh, sure. some surviving in style or whatever, uh, you know, how much does meaning play into that? I think a huge degree. Mm -hmm. I think a huge degree. I, you know, I, I, I was thinking about when I was driving in here about the idea of meaning. And I can think back, you know, I'm old enough now. Um, I just turned 60, which is 
sounds strange when I say it, but it, it, it is what it is. Um, a whole bunch of times in my life where something no longer had meaning for me. Mm -hmm. You know, so, somehow it had lost its meaning. And I, I've watched other people do this uh, um, as well and realized that whatever that thing was just lost meaning for them. You know, I've seen it with relationships. I've seen it with uh, all sorts of things. Ways of life. Ways of life, all sorts of stuff. So I think that idea of, and you'll hear people metaphorically say it, um, that a person means something to them. You know, mm -hmm. she means something to me. Right. Or that, he that means person something. who's close to me yeah, yeah. means something to me. Um, so I think that idea of being in search of meaning, or, or you know, that thing that that Frankel called logo, is probably central to being human. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was something he said in that book that really interested me too. He said that uh, uh, whereas Nietzsche was into power, the will to power, correct. And Freud was in the will to pleasure. Correct. I'm in the will to meaning. You know, yeah. meaning is the central motivation of life. But do, do you think, is it possible that uh, there's different times in our life, like you're talking about, the things that have lost meaning for you or whatever, were, were there different times in life when it was pleasure that was the key or driving motivation and uh, times in life when it was power or when it, you know, and at what point does meaning become? You know, I was thinking uh, yesterday. Someone, someone, I took issue with something that I said, and and it had to do literally with a piece of um, a fairly seminal piece of research um, that was proven wrong over time. It was probably right in the context, but it, it, it became wrong over time because time is part of context and times move on and, and now the context has changed. And I, I kind of said, said to them, well, you, you, you know, you're, you're wanting to throw out everything because this one little thing was, has, it no longer stands or is it incorrect or, mm -hmm. and the idea to me of, of, triangulation, if you, if you talk about doing uh, like qualitative research, which is probably my, my passion more so than, than, than quantitative, but um, you're always trying to figure out how to triangulate stuff. How do, how do, I, how do I triangulate this so that, so that I can go, oh, this, this appears to be from, from these ways, um, um, at least part of this experience, you know, and, and I think Kubler Ross did it in when she wrote her book on death and dying, and and you know, and a whole bunch of other folks have done that kind of research where they're triangulating. And, I, and I've thought about these seemingly desperate kinds of um, theories about things, uh, you know, the Freudians and, and so on and so forth, and and I think it's just an issue of triangulation. Mm -hmm. I, I, so it so whatever angle you want to go in from you're going to find, and maybe we should go in from the different angles and find, you know, to what extent, for example, is pleasure driving a person, and what, yeah. how is power driving, how is meaning driving? Yeah, and I don't, I don't think, um, you know, uh, the sapir wartheran hypothesis, which is one of my favorite things to think about, even though there are people that will take huge issue with that, uh, for the same grounds that I was talking about before, of some, some little piece that they go, oh, oh, oh. But the idea that um, from the world of phenomenon, we isolate categories and types. And those somehow become codified in our language. And that codification becomes the way we're inculcated into thinking about things. So if I said to you, for instance, uh, gestalt, uh, well, you'd have to go around this huge circle of trying to tell me what gestalt mm -hmm. means. Mm -hmm. um, where to a German, it would, it, it's gestalt. Mm -hmm. 
or ever. zeitgeist or any of these other Well, in my mind, I, I think of gestalt or gestalt as the everything. Like you just said, the phenomenon. And right. from, the, from the world of the everything, we isolate types. And Categories that. and types. And if you think about all these things of, of, of medicine, for instance, and when I look at medicine, medicine is a compilation of categories and types. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what category of illness is this and what type? If I think about uh, um, the DSM, I guess we're up to seven now, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, um, it's really a compilation of categories and types or how the world will be ordered. If you have this, this, and this, and this, and this, and at least two of these, then you're that, which is a compilation of kind of categories and types again. Um, and I think that probably everybody that's ever written anything had a piece of what really is. You know, and I was trying to remember, uh, there, who was it? Somebody, maybe this quote will ring a bell for you, resonate, and you'll, you'll go, well, I know who that is. Um, the quote, that formal theories breed children who fight incessantly. <laughs> I don't know, but it sounds kind of like the same author that said, you know, uh, theories like a hammer, <laughs> and you go around looking for things, nails well, to pound. Yeah, and I, I guess that, you know, the idea of, um, it's a pretty strange horse that walks in any direction other than the way its head's pointing. <laughs> you know, it's one of those same kinds of things. If you're if you're looking for that, you're probably going to see it. I mean, that's your right. that's how you're oriented. That's that's you know, you're going to find things that kind of fit your map again. Back to uh, Korzybski that mm -hmm. that that seal your premise that that's mm -hmm. that's the way that is. So believing is seeing. I mean, you're you're I, going to see what you. I think believe to, you're going. To well, see. I think to some extent there there was a guy. Um, um, I was, I was so fascinated with what Bateson did um, that any time I got to see schizophrenics when I was in the world working in hospitals and so on and so forth, uh, if I had a break, I'd kind of go and study them. You know, I'd just talk to them, see what they, what they came up with. And, and uh, this one guy said to me one day, um, I asked him, how, you know, how did, how did you end up here? You know, how, how, why, how are you here? And uh, he said, well, uh, he can't answer that. You know, denying self, there, therefore I'm, I'm not responsible. He said, uh, perhaps you should look at his chart. So I went and I looked at his chart, and, and <laughs> this guy was uh, evidently paranoid schizophrenic. I'm, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know that. But... Um, by the time that they decided he should probably go elsewhere, um, he had painted all the windows in his house black, um, smeared the doorknobs with Vaseline, um, and took drugs, I don't know what type they were, to stay in constant motion so he wouldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. um, because he had the belief that there were FBI agents that were trying to put a probe in his brain and control his actions, make him, make him do things. Um, so the next time I went to talk to him, he, he, you know, I mean, I'd jump in there with him. I don't care. You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. good enough reality. I'm, I'm fine with that. And he said, see that guy over there? And I said, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, um, he's an FBI agent. I said, oh, right. How do you know? How do you know that? He said, look at his shoes. You know, and the idea of, well, all the FBI Taking agents have those stand kinds for. of shoes uh -huh. they stand for. Oh, okay, you know, and then he, he would point out other salient features again, and, and I said, well, then what? And he said, well, he wants to put a probe in my brain. <laughs> you know, and the neat thing was is to the extent that he never got one, a brain probe, right. his plan was working. <laughs> you well, know, but, it's a cell ceiling premise. Yeah. Great. No brain probe. But, but beyond, okay, looking at uh, schizophrenics and people whose uh, mind, their version of reality is probably very different. Right. But looking at, you know, everyday people, 
right. and whose version of reality is still very different. Like on the one hand, you have, you know, going back to politics, you have right. someone who looks at Obama and says, he's great, he's, he's dynamic, great. he's this, he's that. You got someone from the Republican or conservative side saying he's radical, he's ruining the country, he's oh, bringing yeah. us down. You know, it, is there a way to, is everyone right? Is nobody right? Is, is, are we all stuck in our maps of the world? I think we are. You know, and, and, and I, I have, uh, I, I like to watch Facebook. Yeah. Um, and occasionally I'll get in there and poke people just to see what they'll do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of fun to be an agent provocateur and just put something out there that you know people are going to react to and, and see how they react to it and why, you know, what what their map seemingly is for that. Um, you know, and so you get things like, you know, you, you've got a whole group of people that believe that Barack Obama is a, a Muslim terrorist and, you know, yada da yada da yada And by the same reasoning of, you see that guy over there? He's an FBI agent and you can always tell them by and so on and right. so forth. I mean, right. you, you probably can come up with, with all the reasons in, in terms of a map of why Barack Obama is, you know, Christ, I've seen Satan, I've seen, you know, uh, same thing with, with uh, uh, all of them, Rick Perry, uh, any of them. You just go, well, you know, th that lens that you have on is a, is a filter, <laughs> you know, and that, that's how it's working, and, and, and that kind of gives me a sense of what your map is. Right. P pretty quick. But then different maps and different realities do have implications, right? Oh, I my mean, God, I mean, yeah. Barack Obama winning ended up in different implications oh, God, than someone yeah. else winning. And, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, think that, uh, you know, the whole idea of a map is it's going to take you somewhere. Mm -hmm. but, so, so even though they're not a reality, you know, the words, the maps, our right. ideas are not the reality, but... But we act they on are. them as if they are. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that that um, I, my wife one time we were driving through the desert. Uh, we went, uh, we went, drove to California and back over a summer. And I'm lost, and I, I realize I'm lost. I'm out in the desert, and I am, I am lost. And so I said to her, she says, "What's the matter?" I said, "I'm lost. I don't know where." She said, "Well, get the road map." And I said, I'm lost. And she said, well, yeah, but we have a road map. And I said, well, a road map only helps you if you know where you are. Right. I don't know where I am. <laughs> you know? I mean, if you don't know where you are, it's, oh, well, it's, uh, that's great. So I, I think the idea of, that idea of maps, as Korsibsky talked about it, um, that we operate on the world with, um, are probably relational to where we are. You know, we're, we're here and we, we kind of get this map that, that lays out the world that's going to lead us to there. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I, I used to have a sign above my office door that said, check your map. Right. <laughs> right. That's kind of like one of my favorite uh, bumper stickers is Suzanne Winterberger's. It says, don't believe everything you think. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Don't trust your maps. Well, yeah, I think I think that's huge. And I, I, but again, I would make the statement that you have to trust them at least to the point that you collectively can integrate yourself. You know what I mean? If you if right. if if you don't trust at least your map to some level, you lose all certainty right and then then the world be just becomes scary to you right. you know I, I look at Alzheimer's patients for instance and 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 I, I've got some experience with with working with individuals with Alzheimer's and the thing that strikes me the most about them is fear mm -hmm. The, the, they are so uncertain of the world in general they're, they're frightened you know what we're gonna have to hold that thought <laughs> because we've got, remember where we are, we're talking about maps and fears. And for, for right now, we've got to end this segment. And 
Oh, we're going to do this Let's again? Let's get you right back. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Denny, thanks for being You're with welcome, us. You're welcome, Tim. It was a pleasure. Thanks, and thank you.